Hey y'all, welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess, and today we are doing a garden tour, a very special garden tour, because it is the last garden tour that I will ever shoot in this garden. And I had really big plans for this video. I had, uh, I had a lot of ideas for it. But it turns out that moving a farm and a family with six kids and a whole household which you've lived in for seven and a half years and all the stuff you accumulate and all the animals we have and all the farm infrastructure, it turns out that's kind of a big deal <laughs> moving that across the country. So I have put this video off every day over the last week or two. I've been like, oh, I gotta shoot that last garden tour. I gotta shoot that last garden tour. And as it turns out, uh, last night was our last night to sleep in this house and today we have spent the day packing and I'm going to walk you guys around my garden on an ordinary July evening and I think that's probably pretty fitting no bells and whistles uh, no extra fanciness just me and you uh, in the garden which is what it's pretty much always been on these videos and as soon as I turn the camera off I'm gonna go load my kids up and we're gonna go stay at my dad's house because this uh, this is on its way to not being our house anymore. If you're new here, I've been doing garden tour videos throughout the growing season since 2018 was the first year that I did that. It was actually kind of the spark that begun the growth of my YouTube channel. I shot my first garden tour in June of 2018, the very beginning of June. And frankly, I did not think anybody was gonna watch it. <laughs> After I got it edited, I told my husband, Maya, this is a 40 minute video, nobody's gonna watch this. But I really shot it for myself because I knew that in the winter, whenever the cold weather rolled around and the world wasn't green anymore and my garden didn't grow, that I would be deeply saddened by that and I would really, really wish that I had something to look at because I always looked at the photos on my phone and the little clips that I had taken a video on my phone. And I, I shot that first garden tour first and foremost for myself. And it turns out you guys did want to watch them. And with that first garden tour, it was the first video I ever posted. It broke a thousand views within the first 24 hours. And I began posting them regularly. And you guys came along with me on the journey of growing my garden and growing my YouTube channel and growing my farm and raising my family. And it has been such a rich, beautiful journey and I'm excited to continue that in the next chapter of our lives. So we are leaving this beautiful garden, this beautiful farm in central Arkansas. Some of our very dearest friends, Jill and Nathan, have purchased this from us. They have a YouTube channel called Whispering Willow Farm. So she's gonna be taking this over and you guys can follow its progress with her. And Maya and I and our family are going to new pastures, <laughs> quite literally, in South Carolina. So we're going from zone 7B to an area that's like zone eight, kind of close to 7B, zone eight. It's right around the edge of that. And uh, we're gonna be planting more gardens, building another farm up from scratch. And there will be many garden tours in the future. But this one is special because it's the last one here. So many of you asked if I was gonna be taking cuttings of my rose here at the gate. This is a Tangerine Skies Arbor Rose and it has been absolutely majestic. It was my Mother's Day gift a couple years ago, I guess two or three years ago, and now it's completely covering this. We actually just fertilized this about a week and a half or so ago and it's starting to set a lot more blooms. I was hoping to get it to flush with blooms again about the time that Jill and Nathan were moving in and I'm seeing several buds on it. So hopefully that plan will have worked. And I did take some cuttings of this. And so hopefully I can get those to grow well. And I'm planning on having those in my new garden as well. Those are, these were my first rose loves. <laughs> I fell absolutely in love with them. And I'm completely obsessed with them in the spring when that is covered in, in blossoms. The first year I planted that, I almost pulled it out because it was so slow growing up the arbor and I really wanted it to be covered. I almost pulled it out and threw something in there that would grow faster. So these roses are a testament to the value of patience because they were worth the wait. So one of the things that we have been 
doing is we've we cleaned out a lot of the spaces in the garden to get ready i wanted to leave jill um i mean i wanted to leave her something that was already established so if things are producing i left them i did go ahead and replant some beans you can kind of see those starting to come up i left a lot of open space because i wanted her to be able to really hit the ground running here here are the okinawa pink okras these are producing a lot. They're gonna be able to just immediately start eating these. Um, I will tell you, I was slightly disappointed. I don't know, I got these seeds. They look very red, maybe not quite so pink, but they taste really good. I've eaten quite a bit of it. Of course, okra is like insane the way it produces. Uh, we also have some Texas Hill Country and there are some really big ones on here that need to be cut off. You have to harvest okra pretty much daily, sometimes twice a day in the heat of the summer. And once they get so big, they're just not any good. So these are still good. There's still some that can be harvested here. And this is another one of my favorites, Texas Hill Country. You know, when I started sharing about my garden on YouTube, I had no idea what it would be like to get to share the gardening experience with people all over the world. And it has really opened my eyes. Like prior to that, I honestly did not know that okra was such a southern thing. I didn't realize that many people had never even heard of it, much less grown it or eaten it. And uh, it's been pretty cool to talk to people who have tried plants like that that they've seen in my garden. They've tried them in regions where that's just not a common thing to eat. And also, I love that people have shared with me things that are very common in their gardens that might not be as common in a southern, you know, United States garden. And uh, that's just... I don't know, that's something that I've really gained by sharing here on YouTube, is getting to experience those kinds of things from so many people. So this garden is looking fairly wild right now. We've kind of, hey bear, don't go in there, man. There's some wasps that need to be dealt with. Yeah, did he come after you? So I still have to clean out my greenhouse. That is still on the list to do. That's something I'll be coming back and doing here in the next couple of days. I left these black hollyhock plants because I took a lot of seeds out for myself, but Jill had expressed she really hoped that they would reseed. So I figured I would just leave them here and let the seeds fall. Now back in this area, it has peaked pretty well, I would say. There's still a lot of beauty to be observed. But the cosmos are all kind of on the tail end of blooming. Look at the little bee. Hey, little bee. You all right? <laughs> One of my favorite things I've seen on mud. It says, I remember when I was younger and I used to be afraid of bees and now I see them. I'm like, hey, can I get you something to drink? Something to eat? Do you want to borrow the car? <laughs> That's so accurate. You grow up and become a gardener and it's like bees are your besties. <laughs> so back here on the back side of the cottage garden, um, really has developed, and this is pretty much volunteer stuff. Um, I think I threw a few zinnia seeds out here kind of after the fact, and I had planted more dahlias for Jill uh, because I knew she was buying the farm this spring, and uh, she had fallen so in love with the dahlias over in one of those beds. And so I grabbed another bag of little tubers and threw them in the ground here for her. This kind of just came up and it's so beautiful. We've got zinnias here and this Dara, which Dara, you can see these lovely flowers. These are such beautiful additions into like bouquets. I've put these in so many bouquets this year and it reseeds really readily. Dara is a wild flowering carrot, Queen Anne's lace, and it comes in different colors, but this grows really wild on the roadsides here too. And I've got it here in the purple and the white. Uh, but that reseed, so all of this kind of grew on its own this year. And I love the fact that my favorite view from the garden, every year I end up with a favorite view from the garden. And it's different every year. There'll be just one little pocket that the way it feels out and the way the plants go together, I just love it. And I take a million pictures of it and I sit with it. And this year my favorite view from the garden is the view from the driveway as we leave. For good reason, isn't this absolutely stunning? It really is just an extraordinary view. All right, kind of squeeze through all these wild big zinnias. I did end up pulling up some of these iris rhizomes. My mother came and actually pulled these up for me and took some for herself. 
Uh, we took a chunk of comfrey. We kind of cut that back. There's still a good bit back there and it'll respread. Uh, we took a couple of bulbs for elephant ears. Of course, all these things are multiplying, so it's good to thin them out. These iris rhizomes were given to me by a viewer of our channel at the Shindig in 2019. That comfrey, I brought back a chunk of that wrapped up in a plastic Walmart sack from the Elliott Homestead in Washington State when I went out there a couple years ago. And, the, and these elephant ears were from my mom. Now she gave me, I think, like three bulbs of these a few years ago and I put them in. And obviously these have all really multiplied. I plan on doing irises along the fence line by the pond at our new property. And so I'm gonna put a lot of those and I wanted to bring a few from here. Oh, look on the dill. Look at the little future butterflies. So lovely, there are a few of them here. The blackberries are still producing so much. I came out and picked like three handfuls out of all of these wild blackberry bushes earlier today. There's so, so much food growing out here, even in the wilderness. Look at all these beans growing wild volunteers in the walkway. All right. So the noodle bean trellis doesn't look super majestic right now because it's been quite harvested. There are a few on here now, but my mom has been harvesting the stuff out here to make sure it doesn't go to waste. Here's some more Texas Hill Country okra. That was all volunteer this year. Here are Kajari melons and there are quite a few here that are developing. And I bet Jill will get to eat some of those. I think the plants are looking a little bit sickly from the rain and humidity we've had, but I bet it'll ripen some of these. Here I did replant beans underside this because I wanted them to just have a head start. She said she wanted beans on that trellis and that way they'll be able to harvest some. I'm actually not 100% what go is going on here because I did not plant this, but it really is pretty. Again, another little volunteer surprise. Here the chives are struggling with the heat, but they'll do fine over the winter. And these red and white zinnias right next to each other are also volunteers. And how striking are those? I was sitting in the pavilion having my coffee yesterday morning and I looked over at this combination together and I don't know what the varieties are because these did volunteer, but this is probably, I think it's called polar bear or something like that. It's kind of a creamish. And then these giant, something giant, it has the word giant in it, but they're really large flowers. And those are varieties I know I've planted in the garden in the past. So these just volunteered back. And these growing right next to each other is really beautiful. So I'm gonna have to do that on purpose sometime. Here we still got some cucumbers kind of limping along. It's pretty warm for cucumbers, but these plants have produced quite a lot and they're still producing and setting flowers. So I left them. My mom hated the fact that this big bunch of banana trees had kind of died down. We do have one kind of starting to come back here and the freeze had just been too hard for them. So she actually brought another banana plant over and planted it back in this corner for Jill. I'm really excited because in South Carolina, I think I can put some banana plants in my big high tunnel that I'm gonna do citrus and stuff in and possibly get them to fruition, maybe. Does anybody know about that zone eight? I know it's probably kind of on the line of being able to do that. But now I've just grown them really because it's so striking. They get so tall and beautiful usually. This year they're a little behind. But the leaves are fantastic. Um, a lot of people use those in cooking when they make things like tamales. But you can wrap them up and roast meat in them or veggies, grill. It's pretty cool. I know I've said this a lot, but it's like nature's aluminum foil. Nature's, nature's Reynolds wrap, <laughs> if you will. So here are more cucumbers and these are really starting to struggle, but the tomatillos this year have been pretty successful. They're still setting fruit, so I left them in there. Uh, this Thai basil is obviously really large, but the pollinators just love it, so I figured that would be a good thing to leave. Here's some more empty space. My zinnia bed this year was kind of a fail. I really did try to fill that out 
but uh, I also left the sunflowers and I think the zinnia struggled to grow in their shadow but overall this is lovely it has provided some beauty and and in the future maybe I'll get a nice full zinnia bed going but I love these tiny little ones as well as these really large ones I try to grow a, a variety and you know things happen I suppose so one thing this year in the garden was I wanted to let the volunteers grow and there's a lot of that so a lot of these sunflowers are already spent because they started growing really early because I did not plant them and here you can see this one broke over and some little bird or squirrel has been feasting upon the seeds and I just let them so if you want to grow sunflowers for beautiful flowers that you're going to cut and put on your table uh, when they open and they look beautiful there's your moment like as they're first starting to open it's when you want to cut them and put them on your table uh, because that's their peak if you want to grow sunflowers for seeds let them keep going long after they look pretty so um, you have to let it kind of hang its head over it's going to obviously get a lot heavier and the back of the head of the sunflower this thing literally weighs guys like probably close to 10 pounds so the back starts to change color it's not so bright vibrant like green and yellow anymore it starts to really yellow and turn brown and that's when the seeds are going to get more mature now as you can see here this critter helped to themselves and have been shucking these and eating the insides so if if you want to keep your sunflower seeds you don't want this to happen you have to protect them from critters and all you have to do for that is like wrap a piece of tool fabric and tie it around the head or a pillowcase or a scarf or something just protect it from being able to get picked at it'll still ripen and mature in a cover like that but the critters won't be able to take your seeds now i left all these sunflowers these back here were volunteers a lot of the cutting sunflowers that you buy are f1 hybrids and I've been asked by people in the past, well, being hybrid, you can't save the seeds, right? And that's not true. You can save the seeds and you'll still get a sunflower. It's probably just not going to be identical to its parent flower. It's, its genetics are not stabilized. And so I left these here because I wasn't sure if Jill would want to save the seeds. They're starting to mature because these back here, those multi-headed sunflowers, those all receded from hybrid cutting sunflowers that grew there last year. Um, and so they're beautiful. They're still very interesting and beautiful. Those are like 10 feet tall with multiple heads all the way down them. I think that's fantastic. And so I just left all of these and figured if she wanted to save seeds from them, she could. Last year, I actually cut a bouquet of sunflowers from my back garden when I had a whole cutting sunflower garden and took it to Jill. And she saved the seeds out of them then. Uh, she just let them dry up even though they were cut and still save the seeds. So you can do that. Um, ideally, you wanna let them dry on the plant. You wanna cover them and let them dry here. But Jill has sunflowers growing in her garden, her other garden, she's about to leave to move here. Uh, from seeds she saved out of a bouquet. So even when you tell somebody, I mean, even I just told you, well, if you want to save the seeds, you leave them on there. Um, a lot of times gardening rules are just ideal. Oh, it's ideally you would do this, but that doesn't mean you can only do it that way. Break the rules, try other things. You don't know if you can do it until you try. <laughs> Underneath these sunflowers, the zinnias are growing just fine. Of course, I didn't ask these to grow. These grew on their own. And the basil's gone to seed without me being out here every day trying to discourage it. These clematis here, you know, they're pretty well done blooming right now, but those are going to look really lovely in the future if Jill decides to leave those. I think she's planning on it, but I'm not 100% sure. I've already assured her to do what she will, come in and make it her own. Um, she has a beautiful starting point here, but I really do hope that they come in and make this farm their very own. They have some really cool ideas. Oh, cherry tomatoes. I've eaten so many cherry tomatoes the last few days because I'm just thinking about the fact that soon I'm not gonna be able to. Actually, one of the things that I'm gonna do, oh, we need to re-zip that trellis. The zip tie must have broke with all the weight. It's probably been on there for a few years. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna do before we go is I'm going to come down here and pull some suckers which let me show you guys many of you know this if you've been watching my videos for a while 
but all right so if you look at this tomato plant right here you can see the main stem and like right here in this joint is what we call a sucker and I can pull this thing off just like this and I can actually take this sucker and put it in water and it will begin to grow roots and then I can put it in the soil and it will grow into a whole new tomato plant uh, specifically on these indeterminate varieties which is what all these up in the front are if you don't know the variety of one of your tomato plants just google it um, that's what I do if I get a new plant or a new seed I'll just google like sun gold determinate or indeterminate it's the first one I just saw um, whatever the variety is and you'll be able to find very quick information about it a lot of times for some reason even seed packets don't specify most varieties that are commonly sold heirlooms are indeterminate I would say more are indeterminate that are the, the common ones there are plenty of determinate and dwarf varieties but most of the common ones are indeterminate and this will grow into a whole new plant and my plan is to take a jar <laughs> in the cup holder of my car as I travel to South Carolina with several suckers in them. And I have some little felt grow bags. We don't have a garden yet there, but I have some felt grow bags that I thought if I could get these to root and I could get the felt grow bags set up in front of our house or a camper even for now, I could plant these and then I could have tomatoes this fall before it freezes again. And I would like to do that because I haven't eaten nearly as tomato, many tomatoes this year as I normally do because I've been traveling back and forth to South Carolina. But I will tell you that since we've been back here getting ready to move, I have eaten, I've been trying to make up for it. Like I've just been eating so many cherry tomatoes trying to make up for the time that I'm gonna have to go without them. I'm like, my love, I'll meet you again next summer or this fall, hopefully. <laughs> So this little section here is really uh, coming in hard for a, a hard second on my favorite view of the garden. How majestic is this? My goodness. My little volunteer zinnia patch. The first year we built these garden beds, which has been, I don't know, four or five years ago. I can't really remember. I grew a package of zinnias that I received from someone that said Sherbert zinnias. And I've had such a mix of zinnias come up in this section since then. I've never planted them again. They've always come up. And every year they're different. And they're beautiful. They're always shades of pink and different sizes. And I just love it. Back here, some more okra. There was squash down there. It got sick and we pulled it out. And here are the cucamelons, the mouse melons, Mexican sour gherkins. Look at that. Growing with a vengeance. How else could you describe this? This is only six plants. It's like three on this side and three on this side. And that is nuts. So let's go under here. Oh, this is real nice. This feels like a secret club. Yeah, I like this very much. And they're trying to keep, they're trying to keep my wind chimes and I'm like, no, Mexican sourdough guns. Those wind chimes have a date with my garden in South Carolina. I gotta come get all those. I'm glad that I shot this video and saw them because I would not have seen them hidden under here. Mexican sour gherkins, cucamelons, taste very lemony, very bright and citrusy and they kind of pop in your mouth. I like them, some people hate them. I think they're fantastic. And just the novelty of them and the fact that they grow and create you a clubhouse. Come on, I will plant anything that makes me a clubhouse. Look, they pulled this sunflower over and just completely like encapsulated it. Isn't that funny? Here's some little melons. There's a few fruits on there. Nothing ripe yet. Back here are lilies. Several of these were sent to me by viewers and different people, and I actually took some of those out. Of course, they do multiply also. Um, I have some other rose cuttings, too, from some of these other roses. Unfortunately, I did not mark them. I just have like the cuttings all together, so I'll just have to grow them and see. That probably wasn't the best thing to do. Oh, I have a leaf stuck to me. This cucamelons, I said. I love you. <laughs> oh, I'm delirious. I'm so tired, guys. <laughs> We've been working so hard. Back here are rosemary and chives. Of course, those are will stay for years if allowed. And more roses. Here's my little experimental sun gold cherry tomato looking like a wild mess these have given me so much joy this year 
This row is really interesting. These cucumbers have really dried up. Cucumbers start to struggle when it's steadily above, I don't know, really 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. That's really pushing it for cucumbers. Um, and they're gonna start getting bitter at that point. And we've been well above that. So they're really having a hard time. They get kind of funky shaped. Here is the glass gem corn. And I kind of hoped this would get a little further along so that I could see it before I left. I don't know. I think I need to leave it because it'll dry out and actually be worth something if I start pulling them all off now. They're not quite dry enough. So corn is ready to pick as sweet corn. Like the silt kind of starts to dry up and it separates a little bit from the stalk. And whenever it fully dries up, the whole thing will dry up and, and get far away. And this one's getting a little closer and you can kind of see it here. Look at that beauty. Isn't that amazing? Uh, but it still, all of these, that one was kind of hanging open. All of these need more time to dry. So I'm just gonna leave them. I don't know, glass gem corn is gorgeous because they're all different. Growing large amounts of corn is something that I'm really, really looking forward to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make space to actually grow a lot of sweet corn to eat. Up until this point, I've only ever grown small sections because I just didn't have enough space to really devote to a whole lot of it. When you have a lot of kids, you kind of need to grow quite a bit of something. Oh, sweet Maya. Last cup. <laughs> my to-go cup because all my mugs are packed. <laughs> Sip it good. <laughs> Thank you. You ready? I am ready. I'm ready too. Still a few more steps, but. You gonna miss this garden? Um, yes and no. Like, this is like my high school sweetheart, but not the person I was destined to be with for the rest <laughs> of my life. So like, I bless you to go on and love someone else. <laughs> You know, it's like that country song or whatever, you know, like, I hope you're real happy and all that. But, you know, greener pastures. You asked. I'm, I'm glad that I am your South Carolina farm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, really, the thing that I have taken from building this is I just have this confidence that, like, we could build. We could build anything. Like a Lego set. <laughs> Gosh, go on, I got a garden tour to shoot. All right. <laughs> Thanks for the coffee. <laughs> My pottery collection is lovingly packed, but we didn't leave any out to drink out of. <laughs> I'm drinking out of a little paper cup. <laughs> All of these little uncomfortable things are definitely making me look forward to getting settled. Right here, I have some holy basil and some pink potted beans, Tanya's pink potted beans. And I've actually taken seeds from both of these things. Uh, the holy basil, I'm so used to having it in my garden, but I haven't planted it in a few years. It usually comes back on its own. So I definitely needed to take some seeds from that. And then the pink potted beans are some of my favorites and I just wanted to have some more seeds from them. And here are my mess tomato rows. Still pulling a good bit of fruit off, but they're all pretty wild. Not even gonna go down here. Oh y'all, did y'all see Gabriel just ran through the woods after a squirrel? Here's some fennel that's gone to seed. Also a, uh, a place where swallowtail butterflies like to come and lay their eggs. All right. When I thought about moving, shooting this video seemed to be the one I couldn't quite wrap my head around. But I think we're doing all right. We're getting through it. So, I was talking with Maya just now about the lessons that I've learned here. I really did learn to be a gardener in this garden. Um, I learned to stop being a control freak in my life in this garden. I learned that imperfections have value when they're shared vulnerably. I learned that seeds want to grow. I've pointed out so many volunteers to you during this time. I learned the great value in putting a chair in a garden and making it a place where it's also rest, where you take joy in it, where you sit and you intentionally revel in what it is that you've worked for rather than just coming to work. I always say every garden needs a chair. And I learned that right here actually in a little, little set of table and chairs that used to be right here, which used to be the corner of the garden underneath a Bradford pear that used to sit there. 
I've learned so many things. I, I don't think that I will actually know the fullness of them. I don't know, maybe ever. I think that I will be realizing lessons that I learned in this garden for many years to come. I'm gonna end this garden tour here. I know we still have the back. I know that there's the high tunnel and all of that, but I really have kind of relinquished that to Jill. So um, a lot of the stuff that's growing back there, I didn't plant. I've, I've kind of started moving out of that space and still kind of staying up here. But I've really let go because the thing that I've learned the most is that sometimes the very fulfillment of your dream turns out to just be a stepping stone into the next place. And, and for so long I viewed living in town and waiting until I could garden on a large scale as my classroom and I desperately wanted to have this fulfillment and I got it and this was it. But I didn't realize until well over halfway through my time here that I was actually just in the next classroom. And that has made me such a bold dreamer. And you guys, bringing you in this garden has taught me the value of community and the value of sharing. Um, this garden and my experience here, there's no way that it would have been anywhere as amazing as it has been without you. For the seeds you sent me and the plants you sent me and the prayers you sent me, the way you've supported our business endeavors. I wrote a book here and you bought it. <laughs> you told the world that it was good and um, you've showed up for these videos and you've taught me how to garden in so many ways and I know fully that I would not be launching into this next place the gardener and the woman that I am if it weren't for you. So at the end of my final garden tour in my first real garden I want to say thank you for growing with me. I bless you. Until next time.